Hello everyone, we'll start in just a minute. Welcome to the webinar. <clears throat> All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning here in Houston, Texas. <laughs> Welcome to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. My name is Srila Sharma and I'm a professor of epidemiology at the University of Texas School of Public Health here in Houston, and I'm also a faculty member in the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. Um, today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin. The center's vision is healthy children in a healthy world. Before we get started, I just wanna make some housekeeping announcements. The webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on our website at msdcenter.org. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into your questions chat box. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's, let's get started. I'm excited to introduce our speakers for today, Laura Moore and Dr. Wesley McCorder. Laura Moore is a faculty associate in the Department of Health Promotion Behavioral Sciences at our school with a secondary appointment in epidemiology uh, at the Houston campus. She is also the director of the Nourish program and assistant director of the UT Health Science Center Houston Dietetic Internship. Her passion for food began with her training at Le Cordon Bleu, and her expertise is in nutrition, culinary arts, and community garden education. She is trained in weight management for children and adolescents with a focus in obesity prevention and treatment. One of Laura's passions is promoting holistic nutrition education that is sensible, practical, and accessible to all people. Her skills as a chef help bridge the gap between abstract to the practical. She's passionate about educating the next generation of dietitians and practitioners to have the tools they need to serve low income and minority populations. Under her guidance, leadership and dedicated planning, the UT School of Public Health a nutrition program and the Nourish program has gone a significant amplification. The additional components offer students a wide range of hands-on experiences that enable them to help people li live healthier lives. This expansion includes a research and teaching kitchen, also called the Nourish Kitchen, the medical nutrition therapy simulation classroom, and a holistic fruit and vegetable garden. Next is Dr. Wes McCorder. Dr. McWhorter is an assistant professor in health promotion and behavioral sciences, and also the director of culinary nutrition 
for the Nourish program at the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at UT Health School of Public Health. Dr. McCorder is appointed also as a faculty member at the McGovern Medical School and also serves as a national spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and as also an advisory council member for the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. A professional chef, Dr. McCorder focuses <coughs> on interprofessional nutrition education through hands-on culinary medicine courses. He's also a certified strength and conditioning specialist with experience in fitness and corporate wellness. His research interests include closing the divide between culinary literacy and nutrition education and policy. Dr. McCorder graduated from Kansas State University, earned a master's degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch, and a doctorate in health promotion and behavioral sciences from UT Health School of Public Health. These are two amazing speakers that we have today. And with that, I will now hand it over to Laura and Wes to start their presentation, How Good Food Works from Seat to Plate, a discussion with the authors. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. And thank you to everybody that's tuning in. It's always a, uh, a humbling experience to see people tune in, to listen to what we have to say, to, to listen to you know, the vision behind the program and the vision behind this cookbook. So we're excited for y'all to join. If you want to throw in where you're from in the chat box, that would be fun too for us to see that and read that and just yeah. see where everybody's joining in from. But uh, to kick things off, we want to we want to start with, you know, uh, the history of Nourish. So, Laura, I, I don't know if you can just take a few minutes to describe, you know, where did Nourish come from, your vision, a little bit of the background of this program. Oh, sure. Well, of course, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, my background has been very food focused. And as a dietitian, I believe it's very important to talk with your patients about food to get a better understanding of their challenges. To me, that means talking with them about foods they like to eat and foods that are a big part of their culture. And once that conversation begins, it can lead to more information about their cooking skills, their cooking equipment at home, who shops for groceries and who does the cooking so that we are better equipped to help them live healthier lives. So where did Nourish come from? What What's the story of the resources? I know, uh, uh, Srila mentioned the kitchen and the garden and the sim lab. Can you describe mm -hmm. a little bit about the program itself? Well, when I joined the School of Public Health, you know, teaching my students about food and how to talk to their patients about food was the number one priority. Mm -hmm. And at the time I joined, I had 16 student dietetic interns working on their master's of public health degree and meeting competencies for the dietetic internship program. And after I had a chance to assess the program, I realized we needed more resources to enhance their skills and, and give them the confidence that they needed to talk to their patients about food. In my mind, the only way to do that was really to start in the garden, the basics, and then move into a teaching kitchen and then on to the patient simulation lab where the you know, conversations actually began. Um, it took me a couple of years yeah. to raise the funding. It was about a $1.5 million project, and uh, we uh, actually broke ground in 2014. We began building the first of the three resources, um, uh, as you can see on this slide. The garden was completed in 2015. The research and teaching kitchen was completed in 2016, and the simulation lab was completed shortly there. So I, I want to kind of jump into this next slide now and just talk about, you know, who does this involve? It's not just you, you mentioned dietetic interns and master's level uh, students, but who else uh, is part of this educational program? You know, we are we really were so excited to build these resources for our dietetic interns and our school of public health students. And as we got into it, we, we realized that it was probably going to be a much bigger um, project than we imagined. Um, the students really were very receptive. And so we decided that we might reach out to the McGovern medical students to see if they might be interested in, in taking a course culinary medicine, yeah. which you, you can talk a little bit about later. But 
Okay. Uh, the basics, it's it's cooking skills and nutrition, basically, and, and talking to their patients about And we had, a, so, what, 115 students sign up in 15 minutes for the class, and there was only 16 spots. So it was, it was definitely a high-level uh, interest, for sure. Definitely. Start. We were so surprised and, and, and thrilled. And so at that point, we then opened up our courses to medical, nursing, and actual dental students as well, along with the School of Public Health and the dietetic interns. And, you know, it kind of snowballed after that. It just kept growing. Our, our healthcare professionals learned more about what we were doing and were asking more about our, our classes for their fellows and residents. And um, so we then opened up our classes to our healthcare professionals, which was really great. And that really includes your doctors, your um, physicians, assistant, nurse practitioners, our registered dietitians, all uh, were getting community uh, or continuing education credits for what they were doing. And what's unique about this and about the program is that these three classifications of students actually helped us build our train the trainer model. Um, and that train the trainer model um, is uh, what helps keep our program sustainable. Um, because yeah. once we train them, then we move into the community and they actually get to work with our community members. Um, so it's, it's really it's really great. We do work in clinics. Um, I know we had one grant that we worked on where we actually cooked in the lobby um, of one of our <laughs> clinics. And um, I think we blew a couple of fuses a couple of times with our a couple uh, fuses. portable yeah, surprised a few patients that yeah. went in to, to their visit and came out and it, they were in a kitchen. It was like a, a complete makeover very quickly. So it, it was. We have a portable teaching kitchen unit that we, we take off site to our clinics and gardens and hospitals, wherever we're going in the community. And um, it's a self-contained unit. It just plugs into the wall, but it has running water, um, an induction cooktop along with an oven. So um it actually fits through a regular door, but when it actually gets into place, the sides pop up and it, it turns into a real cooking station that we can host about eight students per, per, per unit. Let, let's move on to kind of just going over what the, the resources look like. So the, this slide obviously is the garden, but can you kind of describe where this is, you know, in, in regards to we're in the me Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the world, for those of you that are outside of Houston. But where where does this reside, you know, in the footprint of UT Health? You know, I think that was the first challenge that we encountered um, looking for the right space. You really need six to eight hours of sunlight um, in order to have your crops grow and, and uh, flourish. And so as it turned out, there was a parcel of land between the Sizzik School of Nursing and the School of Public Health still in the, in the medical center, but it happened to be right outside our back door, which was great. And so it was a perfect location and, um, you know, it, it, it just turned out to be great. And I, you know, I have to say that, um, first of all, there's an amazing section in the cookbook it's a resource section in the garden that was written by Dr. Joe Novak, who is also our co-author. It was my, my good fortune to meet him early on, and he is the designer of our garden. He's also adjunct faculty at the School of Public Health, and he teaches a course um, called Garden for Health. Um, Dr. Novak is just, I, I can't say this enough, he's an amazing person. He designed our garden for all people. It is ADA accessible. We have um, A-frame beds, as you can see in this picture on the right. We have raised beds and wall planters, cedar, seated planters. It's truly wonderful. And um, we used cedar um, to build all of our beds and our planters and our framework, mainly because of um, the long lasting um, uh, wood that it is. And um, you'll see a picture later on of actually what it yeah. looks like today. The, the, um, the bottom right picture is what it looked like when we first started building. But um, our fruit trees now surround the perimeter of the garden, and then our vegetable and herbs are in the center. You can see we have a storage facility on the right where we keep all of our tools. Um, in our beds, we have uh, our drip lines, our watering hoses. They're manual because we actually control the amount of water that we use and when we water, for that matter. Um, 
In the bottom picture of your slides, you're going to see three of our dietetic interns, uh, myself, along with Loris Woods, who's our reg resident chef and registered dietitian, who is the instructor now for most of our cooking classes today. Um, as you can imagine, it takes quite a bit of work to manage this year-round garden, and the garden size is about 3,500 square feet, I believe. Um, but we now have 24 dietetic interns who rotate throughout the week, helping us manage the garden while they're meeting their competencies towards the dietetic internship program. So let's let's jump into our next resource, which is the simulation lab, at least on this. And can you just, I mean, I, those of you that aren't dietitians, this might be a little confusing to you, uh, the mannequin in the bed, but the reason for this, describe a little bit of, you know, why we do this and why this is important for the program and how it, translate into, how it translates into the cookbook too. Well, you know, I, I think um, having a simulation lab for a dietetic internship is most unusual. And it was very unusual um, back in 2012, um, unique, I'm, I must say. And to have all three facilities under one roof uh, for training opportunities is even more unique. But the, the simulation lab, um, patient simulation, is really designed to, to give our students um, the enhanced skill set and the confidence uh, to when they get out on the clinical floors to, to do their work. So in the top photograph, um, you can see it's a photograph of the entire patient room as seen from our control room looking into the room. Uh, we have a conference table with 12 chairs that we will use for feedback with assessments um, and discussion of case studies with our interns. We also use it as a counseling simulation table and room. Um, we have a hospital bed, as you can see, and our 3G simulator, as we call him Mr. Sims, is sitting in bed. Um, we have a patient monitor to the left that we use, and then behind the bed, is what looks like a hospital wall, that it's actually a heavy duty curtain that we had a photograph of a hospital wall printed on it. And we have several of those curtains that we can kind of switch out. Um, underneath the photograph, you'll see our lead construct, uh, clinical instructor, Jean Pickaplunkett. She is actually the voice of Mr. Sims. So when our students go through their assessment process, she answers the questions and kind of interacts with the interns and sometimes gives them a little hard time because she wants to be a realistic patient in that sense. Um, she can make Mr. Sims mimic all sorts of chronic conditions that are related to poor dietary habits. You know, I remember going through, I, well, I still remember going through my clinical rotations and, mm -hmm. I, you know, it was very scary. I, we didn't have an opportunity to practice and walking into that patient room the first time and, and talking to them was terrifying and we made mistakes and that was okay. But, you know, honestly, I think that this practice really enhances their skill set and it gives them the confidence to walk into those patient rooms and be successful with helping patients live healthier lives. I, I know, I wish I'd had it because I definitely um, asked a patient that was MPO for a few days how their dinner was and they were not very happy with me on uh, <laughs> on that. So I, I can understand. And that's, that's the beauty part is this practice and the education. And, and that kind of translates to the garden where we're doing you know, hands-on practice. It's not just theory, it's actually application and application in the simulation lab for the practice when they're becoming dietitians. And that gets us into our, our kind of our, our third piece here, which is the teaching kitchen. So explain a little bit about, you know, the build out of that. And, you know, are there a lot of kitchens in schools of public health? I don't think there are. Um, so, you know, a little bit of how that happened. That's true. Well, um, it took a lot of negotiation for real estate uh, for this piece of property, but it is in the lobby of the School of Public Health. And I felt it was extremely important to have a showpiece, not only an educational facility, but a showpiece in the School of Public Health and show people what we're actually doing and what we're training. Um, the picture on the left is um, a, just a basic setup of a kitchen. Our dietetic interns assist. We train them in culinary nutrition, culinary medicine. So they're very, they were well versed on, on the coursework and how to set up a kitchen, getting ready for classes. We chose the tables. They actually roll up and down. So they're in an up position right now where we can actually use it as um, a countertop. So we're cutting. 
but they'll roll back down and we add chairs so we can talk about or discuss um, the class that we've had. Um, we can actually share a meal um, in there um, pre-COVID and after COVID days where we were actually doing the hands-on classes. Um, the center photograph is a photograph of an actual class in session. So you can see the monitors up at the top. It really um, enhances their viewing opportunities. As you can see the instructor, you can see exactly what the instructor is doing. And that's really important when you're getting down to the, the details such as knife skills and whatnot. On the right hand side are two of our medical students who are very happy um, chopping away and, and learning in a culinary medicine class. And then um, the bottom class, Dr. McWhorter, that's uh, there you are showing the students how to hold a knife properly. Um, and then the class on the right holding up their certificates after they have uh, completed an eight-week course in culinary medicine. I think that was one of our first class graduating yeah, classes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, really yeah, cool. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll jump in here and kind of, not to take over, but talk a little bit about, you know, this kitchen and, you know, how it's translated into many things and really what's led us to, down this route of the cookbook too. But, you know, this is the star. We, we had done a lot of demonstration classes and then we, we started doing hands-on. And as Laura mentioned, having the ability to raise the tables up, uh, really focus on hands-on practical activity. And the next thing is, you know, as we got into COVID, what do we do? And that's where we, we were set up to pivot to virtual and do virtual classes, um, remote and offer them in community settings. And that's something we did uh, recently where we actually completed a few studies that talked about um, uh, that we went through and did hands-on cooking classes mm -hmm. virtually with uh, community members. So we had partnership with with Harris Health um, and the Houston Food Bank and, and, you know, with a food pharmacy and what they're doing at Harris Health. So these are some pictures of Harris Health site where they have a farm at LBJ Hospital, their food pharmacy at Strawberry Clinic, and just a few other pictures of their space. So we, we recently published a few papers um, talking about our work there. We're, we're translating from things we've done here with our students to then with our patients and are continuing ongoing now. But we have, you know, we did a big needs assessment to understand what are the barriers, what are the issues. Um, we found out the, the massive importance of cultural humility and consistent messaging across the board. We talked a lot about how practitioners, similar to our students, um, want to learn more about hands-on cooking and hands-on activities to really provide that good advice to their patients. And I assume if any of y'all are practitioners and you you don't have that cooking skill or that background in food, that's something you're desiring as well Is how do I learn how to talk to my patient in ways that make a little more sense in food-based language instead of just calories and nutrients. So um, that's a lot of what we found and a lot of what we're working on to, to kind of move forward when we're talking about this cooking. So we have several other grants and projects that are underway and we're looking forward to publishing more and keeping this information out there more as well. So diving into what y'all are all here for, which is the cookbook. Um, and we have a ton of pretty pictures here. So even if you get tired of me talking, you'll be able to see the pictures. And I do wish we could send this stuff in the mail and send you a, a recipe, uh, you know, uh, ring your doorbell and it would be there, but you'll have to make it yourself. Um, but Laura, I guess describe a little bit of the vision of, you know, why a cookbook, you know, why, how did this come about? What was the plan, planning process and what brought you to this point? Well, you know, it's interesting. It started probably about maybe three years ago. I started thinking about a Nourish cookbook. And my whole goal about building this cookbook, writing this cookbook, and, and sharing it with the world, basically, is I wanted to share what we had done. I wanted to share our program and, and show others perhaps not how easy it is, but what they can do. And, and <laughs> I mean, we had some bumps along the road, but, you know, bottom line, it's doable. And yes, you have to raise funding. There are some challenges associated with all that. But again, my mantra is where I go back to. It's all about training future generations of healthcare students and professionals. And that's that's what this does. That's what we're here all about. So. So yes, but when we started thinking about the cookbook, I reached out to Dr. McWhorter and Dr. Novak, who is what they co-author of The Garden, about the idea. And of course they said yes, and then we just never looked back. We probably should have, but we didn't. <laughs> I have a good friend who uh, 
name is Ronnie Atnick. Uh, she's an awesome cookbook editor and she has so many cookbooks under her belt. And I felt confident that she would lead us in the right directions through this journey. Um, she brought her team along, which was the great food photographer, Deborah Smale. And as you, if you've seen these photographs in this book, they are truly amazing. They just literally pop off the pages. And, um, you know, I, I, it was great. Then she also had a group of awesome graphic artists team um, led by Elise De Silva. And Elise did all of the graphic art, artistry here, as well as the layout of the cookbook. Um, this cookbook took about 14 months to complete. Um, I, I've really never gone through a cookbook writing process before, but I have to tell you, it was a bit daunting. Uh, but <laughs> her end product, I'm so proud of. And the title of the book, How Good Food Works, is our tagline for the Nourish Program. Now, Ronnie told me early on, she said, you're not going to, don't think, even think of a title until to the very end. And she was right. It, it it just the cookbook evolves as you go through the layout and the whole bit. And it's you know as you can see on this slide, the table of contents of how everything is laid out. the The first part of the cookbook uh, really tells about the Nourish program and the story and how we began. And that's we really wanted the story to evolve and then kind of move into actually the the good part, the recipes and and what you can actually do. But after the story, the next section is really about the garden and the garden education. And as I said earlier, it's a great re resource for, for gardening in general. Um, we, uh, it's set up in vegetable categories. So you have roots and stems and flower and flower buds, et cetera. Um, and these actually hold all of these amazing recipes that Dr. McWhorter has developed. They are so delicious. Now, Dolores Woods and I tested all the recipes and we didn't have any problem having tasters. So our 24 dietetic interns really enjoyed the process of, of tasting all of the recipes, but they are, they're so flavorful. This cook is um, more global, I think, in design. And of course, that was the forethought of Dr. McWhorter, looking at cultures and seasonings and flavorings, and they're just abundant in this rest in this cookbook. It's just it's just super. So, um, but again, getting back to writing the cookbook is really about sharing what we've done yep. and sharing the training process. And and that's why we're so excited for y'all to join in on this webinar. And you know, uh, obviously, um, uh, Laura didn't mention this, but this is a fundraising book for us. This helps fund all of our classes. We're not taking funds back as, as authors. We're donating all of that back into the program. So every book you buy um, helps pay for classes and pay for community classes and helps keep our program where it's sustainable. So. If you're thinking about that, thinking of a gift, this helps us do that process. So I'm going to jump in and talk about kind of the the, the vision a little bit here. And since the, the cover of the book has the squash blossoms, I was going to describe the seed to plate. So most cookbooks aren't set up on the agricultural type setup where you have, you know, mm -hmm. leaves and, you know, roots and stems. So we're, we broke it down to those categories based on gardening and, you know, the types of vegetables that go together. And then we created recipes within that. So, you know, what we, what we think of when we're talking about uh, this book is, you know, we start in the garden, you know, planting and in the seeds, and then we see the plant and then we harvest and it turns into, you know, for this recipe, the squash blossoms are turned into a pizza. And that's like, that's the kind of the full circle for it where, you know, almost full circle, because if there were any leftovers, I hate, I would hate it if there weren't leftovers over this, but if there were leftovers, we would compost it and put it back in the garden. So it really is that full circle um, approach for, for the, this cookbook. So each recipe has that in, in mind where it's, okay, this is the vegetable out of the garden. And we want to use the whole vegetable. We, want, we don't want to just use the smallest piece of it. We want to use everything we possibly can um, from carrot top pesto, where we're taking the, the tops of the carrots, not just discarding them, and we're cooking them, you know, and, and turn into a pesto. Another thing is like for broccoli, we use the stems and we shave it and we turn it into a, a, a salad, which you'll see uh, pictures of that. Um, you know, these are some drawings of the garden, which Laura already talked about, but just to describe, you know, the, the setup and there's MD Anderson in the background. This is the nursing school. So we're right in a medical center. There's actually a, if you, if you've been to Houston in the med center, there's a, a walkway where you can see out into the garden. We often have patients and people come by, walk through the garden space. 
this entrance here, which this was right after a freeze, so it's not fully uh, bloomed, but this is our butterfly garden, which is just really huge right now. Well, not right now because of the, the winter, but once the spring comes back, the, the, the butterfly garden is just really, really pretty when it comes to walking through it before you get into the actual food garden. We have a lot of resources in the cookbook for gardening. It's not just cooking, so you know it's different tools and how do you do these things. So Dr. Novak really provided a, a lot of great information for the, the basic gardener. You don't have to be the green thumb. You can be a starter um, and learn how to do some of these things, whether it's in a pot, which that's something that the program teaches is we have, you know, um, the garden class and we, we teach it even a virtual session where you can do it um, remote in your, um, uh, we have a remote uh, gardening class where you have your own little potted plant that you do yourself uh, from your balcony window or wherever you, you might have that space. So just some different um, garden spaces. And I love these pictures here just to illustrate the different categories of vegetables um, that we utilize in the book and just how pretty these things can be even in their raw form without doing anything to them. And I think that's, as a chef, that's something that we wanted to keep true to this, the story is not doing too much to the food. Oftentimes we can put too much on things and go too far and then we we lose the essence of what the food is. And with, with if you start with beautiful ingredients, it, you don't have to try mm -hmm. very hard. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I, my story as a chef, I like to like to do things that way where I, you know, kind of listen to the ingredients and listen to the vegetables and the, you know, the herbs and the spices and say, you know, what, what really goes well together. And there's some fun things that we put in there. And Laura mentioned, you know, um, I did, I, I, I do love food and I, I think there's a lot of variants that can be out there. I would say this cookbook has a good amount of things, but there's probably 5,000 more iterations we could put in here. And this is obviously my translation of many foods and flavors, and it doesn't mean that it's better than one culture or the other, but it is something to show the opportunity of what can be done. And that's where we we didn't go from you know one route where we you know are vegan or we are you know only plant based, but we included animal meats and animal proteins of all sorts, just like plant based proteins. The the key focus for us is really having a plate that is full of vegetables and fiber rich foods, and that that can be across a variance of populations and people where some people want to be predominantly plant based and others are trying to just get one vegetable on their plate. So we literally have um, extremely complex dishes in here that'll take you four hours to make. Um, and then we have simple <laughs> microwave dishes that'll take, you know, two minutes to make. So mm -hmm. there's a big variance on what, uh, what skill is needed. And that's something that we purposefully did to show the range of things that you could do. Um, I'm not certain you'll see many uh, recipes for microwaves in a lot of books, but it really fit well for what we're doing. This this first example here is just, you know, some grilled vegetables. And I wanted to put this up here because it talks about, you know, the different types of vegetables that you might have that you can grill. And then the different, we have several options in the back of the book for different flavored oils, for pestos, for, for other seasonings and dips that you can add to your vegetables to change up the flavor. Um, we've seen, and I would guess to give an example, in one of our cooking classes, this was about four or five years ago, we had about 25 people represented. And... We just asked the question, you know, like, what's your food culture? And we had over 20 different food cultures represented within that class. And that illustrates the diversity of Houston and the importance of offering many examples in our food, that it doesn't just have to be this one flavor profile for me that I like as a chef. There's many other things that can be available. So that kind of ties back into the way we operate and teach classes, too. This is a dish that our medical students really love. It's a it's a little elevated for the pictures, but essentially it's it's taking some some simple ingredients and then roasting cauliflower, and it comes out where it's the sweet, spicy, and garlicky flavor that a lot of us really really love. Um, you can turn this dish into being not just vegetables. It can have many other ingredients. It can include animal proteins. You can include some some other seeds and nuts to it too to to make it more of a complete meal. But this is one of our favorites, and it, it's just one of those you know delicious flavored dishes um another one just to show like you know we just had the super bowl you know i know some people don't <laughs> want crispy uh zucchini but this is a way to have a, a crunch crunchy vegetable i would argue of the 185 of y'all that are on here probably <laughs> everyone loves french fries or most of you do this is not mm -hmm. the same thing but it does have that same crunch and that's something that we you know want to you know that we know is a good entryway for people is that roasting of a vegetable because it adds that crispy texture and that mouthfeel and the palatability that people really love. And then we pair it with some roasted vegetable 
that are pureed into a dip and we you know it's a romesco sauce essentially which is a, a really nice kind of touch point and it adds a great side dish this is one of the dishes i was talking about when we talked about um you know just simple you know i i'm a father of two kids i understand that we all don't want to be cooking three course meals every night it's not it's not realistic but i can take some broccoli some butter, garlic, you know, some seasoning, a little cheese, microwave, and you know, three to five minutes, I have a nice side dish. And you can swap that out with other vegetables that you enjoy. We do green beans, we do cauliflower, we do carrots. There's a lot of different things that we can do to kind of add a side dish. This is a great way for people when they're in a hurry or in a pinch to still get vegetables on their plate. Another thing that you'll hear me talk about a lot and really uh, our program is we don't want sad salads. <laughs> and uh, the, the common refrain of a, a salad that's just like, it's just air, there's nothing going on to it. So I, I wanted to highlight this salad, which we have several in the book, but I wanted to highlight this one because, you know, it has the spicy arugula in it, but not only that, it has a hot, spicy paprika uh, vinaigrette, which is just kind of the change. It's not a sweet vinaigrette, it's actually spicy. So it's a, it's a different concept. We also take the tomatoes and we char them in the, in the oven with chickpeas. And that charring of the tomato really pops the umami flavor for the for the whole salad together. We add you know, a lot of other just kind of delicious ingredients, including some some good cheese. Like we take the cheese, we we roast it, make it crispy. So there's a lot of things going on in the salad that makes it exciting and enjoyable. If you're not someone that just wants plant-based protein, this is an easy way to add in an animal protein or a fish or something like that too. There's a, a lot of variability within uh, many of these dishes. I like to highlight this one too, because this is kind of a, a comfort food. Um, it's a shepherd's pie. And yes, there's a mixture of potatoes and cauliflower, but it's it's in its essence, it's still, you know, there's meat and potatoes. And that's something that a lot of our participants and, and patients in classes are are very much consuming. So what are the, what are ways that we can work within that to highlight or add in additional vegetables that are already in there? So, you know, there might already be, you know, carrots and corn in the dish. So can we just add a little bit more? And that's a lot of the approach we use in some of these recipes. We have simple breakfast foods as well from overnight oats where you can, you know, make one big mixture and then have different toppings. Uh, a lot of us like the same thing for breakfast. We don't want a lot of variants. So doing something that's pretty simple, that doesn't take a lot of time that you can grab and go, is especially, you know, great when there's the added fiber and good quality nutrients and not much added sugar um, to the dish. This is one of those complex dishes I was talking about. Um, you know, we have a, a riced cauliflower that we've uh, put a lot of herbs in and garlic and seasoned and, and charred. We took the snapper and really seared the skin and got a nice crisp texture on it. You know, obviously descaled, scored it. Um, we took some cauliflower, seared that as well. And then the, the beautiful thing about this is we we have, we took the, the lentils and we roasted those off with a little Parmesan cheese and made them crispy and crunchy. So you have this, the different textures in this, in this dish combined with that kind of cooler tomato uh, coolie to top it off and kind of tie everything together. This is a dish that will take you some time to prepare, but it will definitely um, be a winner for those of you that, you know, want to try fish and want to try mm -hmm. some new things and really kind of advance, a, you know, a meal for your, your family or something along that <laughs> line. But do be prepared, you know, on some of these dishes, like this one too, the lamb dish, where we, we took in, you know, herb crust of the lamb, made a nice tabbouleh salad with a lot of fresh vegetables and herbs, and then took, you know, many of you might know the, the the hummus, but we essentially similar thing where we do a bean spread. We do bean spreads with a lot of different things. We actually have, this one is a fava bean and there's turmeric in there to really give it that beautiful color and, and highlight the, the beauty. Um, we talk about that a lot in our, our, our food is that we want people to eat from a rainbow and not a bag of Skittles, but essentially from vegetables and, and, and fruits and things that have a lot of color because that's where the nutrients are found. So when you see things like, like this, you can just see that there are a lot of beautiful vegetables and nutrients in this dish. And it still has those animal mm -hmm. proteins, which a lot of us really still want to eat. But we look at the portion size and how much is actually on the plate. We actually do, like I mentioned, a lot of different bean parades uh, from a chocolate hummus where it's a sweetened dish and we turn it into a s'more. So there's marshmallows and graham cracker topping, and that is a dessert, but it's still a little better than because it does have the pureed beans in it. I already mentioned using animal proteins, but again, I'm just highlighting some different options. We have a steak here, but it's combined with the succotash. It's not just a huge steak on the plate. It's combined with vegetables and it's included there. And that's, that's how we kind of formulate our, 
our dishes to make sure that there is enough on the plate as far as um, vegetables are concerned and, and the ver you know getting fiber in people's meals. I love this picture um, just because it shows several different you know food items. So just some some roasted garlic, some pickled onions, some you know garlic and herb dip, uh, hummus. There's just a lot of different things that we've you know we've put on there. If you're doing a party or you have people coming over, um, if you need spice blends, if you need seasoning blends, if you need you know flavored oils or what to do with leftover vegetables, we have pickling uh, ideas. So there's a lot of things that you can do within this cookbook to really give you some ideas of what to do with, you know, the, if you're gardening, you <laughs> Laura didn't mention that. Gardening is difficult. I don't know. I can't see if y'all are chatting back to me, but gardening can be rather difficult. So if you harvest something, you kind of want to use it all. You don't want to throw it away. And we've made sure to include ways that you can preserve and keep things and make them last longer Definitely. Um, because it can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, you know, having pasta. This is couscous, but it's a simple kind of side meal. It has a tahini and, you know, blended, um, it's a bear bear spice and then mm -hmm. tahini and then blended green grapes. And it's a beautiful dressing. It kind of maybe it sounds a little random, but it's a really beautiful dressing. Um, that adds a, a, a pack of punch, um, a lot of fresh lettuce, and then you know you obviously have um, the, the 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 grain, the, the the couscous with the chickpeas. You could add an animal protein here if you wanted, or a piece of fish would be really great mm -hmm. on this. But it's just there's a lot of flavor going on here, and a lot of differences. This is you know could be considered a bowl or a salad, but much different than the hot paprika um, salad as well. This is one I mentioned earlier when I talked about using the whole vegetable. You know, we're we're shaving broccoli stems, and then it has the shishito peppers, which these peppers, like one out of every 10 or 15, depends on where you look, are hot. So most are mild, but you'll get one and it'll be really spicy. So it's kind of a, a fun game to play. Hopefully you don't get several of them that are spicy, but um, it is fun. It's a it's kind of a, a really enjoyable kind of. Um, uh, thing to add. The, the bonito is a, a shaved dried fish too, so it adds a, a very unique umami flavor. Um, and then the, the dressing here also has a lot of fresh ginger in it. So this is a, there's a lot going on in some of these dishes. Um, and some might be a little much for others. Others you might, this might be right down your alley, but I promise there's a lot of variability in this book. The flavors are really all over the place. Um, this is another breakfast dish, just, you know, Different colors, sweet potatoes, roasted off with some pecans, a little little topping, and then you know put it in the oven and have a nice breakfast dish. So if you had roasted potatoes, sweet potatoes, or something the day before, had a dinner, save some, turn it into brunch, have a nice uh, additional meal for yourself. Um, I mentioned that we have several options as far as like complexity and simplicity, and this is one of those simple dishes where. You know, it's essentially a, a pork stew, but we really amped it up with more cabbage. Um, for those of you that maybe are a little, eh, I don't know about cabbage, I would really, you know, uh, suggest you try cabbage, give it another shot because there's, it, it lasts forever. So if you buy it, it's not one of those things that's gonna, gonna waste. Um, and then there's a lot of things it can hold up to a, a strong stew. It can hold up to strong flavors and it has a lot of good texture to it. Um, as long as you're cutting up small, it makes it easy for people mm -hmm. to eat and consume. But this is one where we we also added some some beans to it to you know where we're getting more plant-based protein along with the pork um, and the vegetables. So this this has a lot of of things and and options to go with uh, for a, a stew. And then I'm I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just want to say that was my favorite recipe. I, I absolutely yeah. love it. It was yeah. so tasty and so good and so easy to prepare. Yeah, and it's that's the thing is like sometimes the most simple can be the best, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be super complex. And I that's you know going back to my first kind of saying is that sometimes we do too much to ingredients as chefs. <laughs> we like to do a lot because oh you know I I can make this better, but oftentimes it's just oh no there's there's beauty and simplicity. And uh, my first foray into cooking, our, our executive chef at the restaurant I was working at had all of us young line cooks line up and say. We're gonna make the best asparagus soup. Use whatever ingredient you want. This is the challenge. So we all got all the fancy ingredients we could possibly think, and we're all doing everything. And chef, all he did was asparagus, onion, garlic, mm -hmm. and then he had thyme, and that's it. You know, water. 
and he made his was way better than all of ours. All, all of ours were too complex, too much in there, too much going on. And his really shined the light on the ingredients. And it was a very, very good learning experience for me. So, you know, as you're cooking some of these dishes, there's variability in, in the option for, for ingredients. This is another one. We have a burger and it's a blended burger. I mean, it's beans mm -hmm. and and beef and that's that's the beauty of it is we're trying to say you know like i mentioned earlier you don't need to be vegan or you know all plant-based it's not realistic for most people but there's ways that we could you know actually save some money because beef can be more expensive so adding in a can of black beans can actually save some money and also mm -hmm. increase the fiber and the um and stretch your meals when you have a larger family it's nice to not have to buy so so much food and also fill people up just as equally and this is just a fun vegetable dish um, you know, in the wrappers, if you never made spring rolls, it's kind of a fun thing to do, especially with kids. You can get them wet, roll them. They might not come out looking super neat, but it's a fun way to have your kids involved. Um, the, the wrappers aren't super expensive. You'll probably break several, but it is a fun way to kind of have the kids playing. And with the peanut sauce, you can make it less spicy or more spicy and the kids will enjoy it. Yeah. I mentioned the asparagus soup. This is our take. It has a lot of garlic in it, a lot of that roasted garlic and some of the pickled onions, which to me adds a, a fun uh, take. We have some scallops over here. Um, there's a mango and kind of like a Southwest take and then a, a spicy dressing to go along with that. And then wrapping up here on, on the dishes, uh, shrimp and grits from, from me is my childhood. That's one of my favorite dishes growing up. We elevated this a lot, not elevated. We made I guess the, the plating of it looks very elevated, but the um, uh, it has a lot of, um, we did it with tomatoes, like charred tomatoes and then greens so that we get a lot of the juice and we cook the, the grits where they're real thick so that as the, as the, you know, when you plate the grits and then you put the greens and the tomatoes on, it really absorbs that, that flavorful liquid into the grits and adds a big punch. We also put cheese in our grits and then oftentimes we'll mix in um, some, some white beans or some lima beans to add some additional um, fiber into the dish. Another simplistic recipe we have is just, you know, your boxed um, uh, uh, pasta. And then it's just a quick, add some mushrooms. We make a quick brown butter sauce. So you, you really can take, you know, your average weeknight meal, elevate it without much complexity. Um, and that's something that we, we also tried to show in here is just having a, a broad range. I already mentioned the hummus. But this is a, a fan favorite. You know, it, it sounds kind of gross if you've never had sweet hummus or sweet, you know, bean spread, but it actually comes out really well. A lot of our, our kids groups that we've done classes with mm -hmm. really, really like this. There's other flavors and, you know, you can put peanut butter in it or, be, you know, other uh, nut spreads in there to add, you know, some of that flavor to a lot of different things you can do with it, but a lot of fun. And who doesn't like s'mores? That's right. So wrapping up and, you know, just kind of Jumping into, um, uh, I guess, turning it back over to you, Laura, is, you know, um, I, th this is this is the book. There's a lot of things that we can do. There's a lot of things that, you know, we we showed in the pictures. I hope you all will purchase a copy. Um, but Laura, anything to, to wrap us up on the presentation? Well, I, you know, uh, honestly, it's our heart and soul. We put a lot into it, but uh, the fact that it's going back into our community programming, all of our proceeds, is is really important for us. That's that's what we that's why we're here is is to work with the public health in general. Yeah, so really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you all for listening. Um, I know yeah. Dr. Sharma is back on. We have a few more minutes. Um, I will say we have the website here for the cookbook, um, also are the program website. If you're an Instagram person, um, you know, at how good food works. Um, this is our contact information, both Laura and myself, if you'd like to reach out to us. This is what the book like, looks like if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, but you can go to the website, see that. Um, thank you all for listening and we will open it up to questions. Oh my goodness, who's hungry? That, that was an incredible. <laughs> incredible uh presentation uh and i have a copy of the cookbook and it is is it is truly fantastic and as a mom of two young growing boys it just has sort of the breadth of ideas that can go for the whole family right which is what you need you, you need something i'm not running a restaurant at home so i need something <laughs> that'll work for everybody no short order cooking right <laughs> and i really like that about the book but just so we have uh, the information clear to our audience uh, for if folks want to buy the cookbook 
go to the cookbook website and order your copy. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. How good Wonderful. food works cookbook.org. Or they can Great. go directly to Amazon as well. It, it, both both sites take them to the same place. So it's on Amazon as well. Okay, wonderful. Well, I hope everybody can um, get a copy. It'll support our students, which we're all uh, always excited about. Um, all right, so let's jump into some. We have a lot of questions. And, <laughs> and if we don't get to all the questions, uh, both uh, Laura and Wes have put their emails here on this uh, slide. And so you can directly connect to them um, uh, as well. So let's, the first question, which uh, uh, being a vegetarian myself, um, uh, there, I, I want to ask, are there a lot of vegan recipes in the cookbook? Yes, there, there's a range. So there's definitely mm -hmm. vegan recipes, definitely vegetarian recipes, you know, dairy free, um, are we, you know, dairy alternatives, there's, um, you know, plant based only options. So there's a, there's definitely a range of all of that. We try to be um, as inclusive as far as that is concerned. So yes, and there's many swaps that you could do as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, and I will attest to that, having <laughs> used the recipes. Um, Okay, and the second question is about the culinary medicine approach and how has culinary medicine been translated into hospital kitchens and medical systems? And Wes, you talked a little bit about the work yeah. with Paris Health, yeah. uh, but the, the adjoining question is, has this approach of culinary medicine opened job opportunities or translated to better salaries for dietitians? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't know who asked that, but thank you for asking that. Um, I would say, so it, it's two pronged. Yes, this is, this is changing things. It's still on the periphery. So we see that um, uh, this is the way forward as, you know, point, pointing to Harris Health, the commitment for Harris Health to put in a, you know, a, a farm on their property to build in. They already have three teaching kitchens and food pharmacies built at site. So that is a big investment for them. So, yes, it is changing things. We're seeing a lot of publications come out where there's studies have been occurring for the past five, six, seven years where we're yeah. seeing the advancement and seeing people make changes to, you know, the staffing we've seen also with our system-wide training of the rds at harris health that this is a, a different type of practice if you're a dietitian this isn't something you normally did i know many of us as we went through our education unless we had other culinary training we weren't exposed to you know hands-on cooking by any stretch so it is a new scope to learn for some people but many dietitians really have that they have the nutrition knowledge they have the information it's really translated into you know about food and really you know uh as practical as it can be so yes um, you should get on board. It is changing. It is happening. Um, as the publications come out, as the data keeps coming out, we'll see more funding to stretch that. And then we'll also be able to start changing the scope of practice. Um, that's something that a lot of us are working on doing is, is arguing that, yes, this is within the scope and this is an area for dietitians to really not just participate in, but really be leaders in the field. Um, it's, an, it's an area that we really fit well in. And it's a way for us to get out of our silos and work you know, together with together. all of our other practitioners at the kitchen table, because that's what a, a teaching kitchen is. It brings everybody together. It was a related question, uh, since you're also heavily engaged in the academy, is this a conversation that's happening in the academy as well? So I can't speak on behalf of the Academy for this instance, but I will say there's definitely a lot more things happening in the food as medicine space, which is also in the periphery. And there's several publications. We put out a publication just recently in Jan. So yes, the, this is something that, that they're aware of. It's something that um, that I would say, uh, like, like many of us that are in this field, are arguing to make it more in the forefront because it is a way, like I mentioned earlier, to, for us to, to, to work together. I mean, we work with PAs, we work with nurses, we work with uh, social work, we work with, I mean, community health workers, physicians, and we're seeing the, you know, um, I'm gonna I'll mention this just briefly. And in our needs assessment that we did, we saw the disconnect between you know physicians and dietitians and not knowing what they do. So as we get into this space, physicians and other practitioners really understand the the importance and the skill level of dietitians mm -hmm. as well. So yes, it's a great way for us to move into. Yeah. Great. All right. So next question. Um, are any of these classes available online? I'd love to learn more, but do not live locally. Laura, I'll let you take that one. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, yes, we 
they will be soon. We we are getting ready to start our new session coming up. I think it'll probably um, be in April or May, but you can reach out to us, um, email me or Dr. McWhorter, or one of us will have a line uh, and, and tell you the dates that we're getting ready to start. But yes, we're getting ready to start them soon. Yeah, and virtual virtual classes is something we've been heavily invested in even before the pandemic learning and, and doing best practices. So it's it's not outside of the scope for us to do. It's just uh, the within which classes are we offering. But yes, we do definitely offer um, things occasionally. Great, wonderful. Um, so the next question is around the garden. Are all the veggies in the cookbook grown in the school's garden? Uh, and how many varieties? Well, I, I will say, I'll, I'll jump in there just for a few minutes and Wes, you can add, uh, yes, we, we, we grow all varieties of, of crops. Our, um, our crop rotation changes seasonally and we have spring, actually there's two parts of spring, early spring, late spring, then we go into summer early fall, late fall, and then winter. So we have a variety of crops on an annual basis, yes. Yeah, and I would say like, you know, some things don't grow wonderful in the garden. Corn would be a good example. I mean, we, we grow it, but it's we need more space. Um, and the garden has always been designed as a, a showcase to say, this is what you can do. Uh, meaning we do have to purchase other vegetables if they don't fulfill all of our classes needs, but it's a showcase to say, you can grow these different things and these items. Um, we try to be as true as possible to any vegetable that's available in the Houston area too, which mm -hmm. that's that's where we yeah. came from. Yeah, definitely. As someone who went to school in Iowa, I know what large corn fields look like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. All right. So next question, which is related to gardening. So let's let's stay in that space. So in promoting buying and doing gardening, do you keep family income in mind and also availability of space? And I. I I'm excited for you to answer that question about the garden and how it's structured. Well, yes. Well, we, as I said, we have a 3,500 square foot garden, um, so it's it's relatively small in acreage terms, I think. Um, so it's it's really designed as training uh, for our our team uh, that we can actually go out in the community and utilize that training skill out in the garden. Um, but what we also do is, is teach our students and teach our participants that it's, you, you don't have to have much space to garden. You can garden in, inside your home. You can garden on a patio. They're just, I mean, it's just that just get started <laughs> basically okay. is what it's all about. You know, a container garden for that matter, I think is we, we it's open up to all of us. Yeah, and I would, I would add too, I mean, I think in the Houston area alone, there's around 150 community gardens and very few mm -hmm. are actually fully, you know, uh, volunteers aren't really doing uh, doing enough. And that's where we're, we're trying to train our students to, to volunteer and to work more in their community gardens. And also to say, if you don't have space, there might be a community garden around you, or maybe you could start one and that could be a process for you to also mm -hmm. have those vegetables. It is a place where not often can you you know, do you even have enough sunlight in your balcony, yeah. you know, so maybe yeah. there needs to be a, a community garden spot. And that's something we work in our community uh, uh, work too, is, you know, working with, you know, for instance, like Harris Health or with the food bank and saying, okay, here's a distribution of, of these food items. And that's kind of the translation from the, the garden to the kitchen is that preparation of what do you do with these vegetables that might be a little different than things you've grown up eating. I, I know I've seen um, many things uh, that are in the food distribution bags. I'm like, I have no idea what that is. I don't know what that big squash thing is. I would have to look that up and Google it and figure out how to cook the thing. So um, for someone like myself that has a, a lot of cooking experience, that's something where we're trying to break down those barriers and provide a lot more um, simplicity for sake. And I will, I will say in our virtual cooking classes, we had a lot of challenges with students from um, around the country who just didn't have the sunlight. Uh, to grow outside or even the space. And so we talked a lot about lighting on indoors and actually showing them how to use artificial light basically to grow their vegetables. Yeah, well, I, I remember my boys who started eating a lot of greens when they came That's home right. with the container garden from That's the right. summer camp, the kids camp yeah. at, at Nourish. So, yes. um, so it, it, it works. Uh, so last question uh, for the day. 
Um, are there substitutes noted in the book for things like beans if a por person cannot eat them? So are there substitutes? Yeah, so in many of the recipes where there is a bean or something like that, you know, if it's a specific recipe like the the hummus, for instance, that's going to be a, a kind of a, a miss on that one. But other dishes where you know the pork and bean stew, you can omit the the, the bean. Other ones we have the bean as the primary uh, protein source. You could swap any of the other proteins and cook similar ways. So yes, there's there's options for you. Um, and you know, not every single dish has the exact option, but definitely there's a lot of options. Definitely. Great, wonderful. Well, it looks like we've run out of time. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and thank you so much to our speakers today. We appreciate you being here. Um, remember that the webinar will be archived on our website at msdcenter.org. Thanks again for joining us today and we will see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye.